If you've been keeping up with current events, you know that SpaceX recently set a record for deploying the largest ice sculpture in low Earth orbit. That's not what actually happened. What actually happened was there was an oxygen leak on the second stage during a regular Starlink launch, and then the engine exploded. Kinda. What Elon actually said was that the upper stage restart to raise the perigee resulted in an engine rud. So, RUD, R-U-D, is Rapid Unscheduled Disassembly. It's, it's when your rocket ceases to be a rocket and you didn't intend for that to happen. Now, okay, no big deal. There weren't human beings on board. It was only 20 Starlink satellites. It wasn't even a customer payload. It was SpaceX's own payload. So, big deal, right? Well, the end result is that the FAA grounded all Falcon 9 launches until the situation was handled. What does that mean? In a nutshell, something went wrong with a rocket launch, and they're not allowed to launch that rocket anymore until they handle the situation. And I choose those words for a reason. But let's start by looking at what actually happened that we could see on the SpaceX webcast. So in this launch, carrying Starlinks, which happened out of Vandenberg, you see the entire first stage was all great. Bog standard SpaceX Starlink launch. They happen all the time. It's like the bread and butter of Falcon 9's payload history, right? And the second stage seems great as well. You actually see the stage separation, and then you see the MVAC ignition. That's the single engine on the second stage. And that seemed to be going just fine, until about two minutes into that MVAC burn. Now, look at this area, right? The backside of the second stage is sort of covered in this mylar plastic sort of insulation. And we see that insulation sort of crinkle and move and get affected by puffs just about every single launch. But in this launch, something totally different happened. The insulation actually looks like it inflates all of a sudden. It's like something inside suddenly pressurizes it that we don't normally see. Now, th that looks weird. I mean, compare it to a normal launch. Here you go, look. This is what it normally looks like, alongside of what we saw here in this problematic launch. Yikes. And not only does the installation balloon up all of a sudden, but we actually see stuff coming out of it, a lot more than you normally see. Every now and then we get little pieces of ice that come flying by, and they end up down there, they dance around on the engine bell, but this is a lot worse than we've ever seen. And in fact, it actually sort of starts to solidify into this, this solid ice structure that you see starting to take over the, the side of the backstage there. Now, what we see leaking all over the place here is oxygen. When they store it in the rocket, it's in liquid format because that lets them fit more oxygen in while well, they can still pump it around and stuff. And as it leaks out, it becomes less dense liquid oxygen, which is really just gaseous oxygen. But while that's happening, some of that oxygen is actually freezing solid around the side here, creating this ice sculpture that I joked about. <laughs> Okay, so not great. You see something that isn't normal for a launch, but the big concern here is, is it going to run out of liquid oxygen? The liquid oxygen is, is one of the critical two propellants that they use to actually propel the rocket forwards. You have RP-1, which is the, the fuel, and liquid oxygen, which is the oxidizer. Now, you need both of them to operate a rocket engine. When you're in space, there's no atmospheric oxygen, so you can't be like a jet engine and suck in the oxygen. You have to carry your oxygen with you, which is what they're doing. If they run out of that liquid oxygen, then the engine isn't going to have the propellants it needs to actually create thrust, and you have a problem. Both Elon and SpaceX confirmed on social media that an anomaly had occurred on the second stage. Now, like I originally mentioned, Elon actually said an engine rut occurred, but we don't know exactly what that means. It's not like a space battle explosion where everything goes up in a huge, unlikely ball of flame. It might have just been that the engine itself let go, but the main structure of the second stage was largely intact. We know that's probably likely because the payloads actually did get deployed, they just weren't in the right orbit. Or they weren't in an orbit that they could survive in for long. There's a lot of possibilities. We know that SpaceX has cameras on there. Maybe one day they'll release the footage of what actually happened when the second stage engine had a rud. That would be cool. Okay, so standard Starlink launch. Something went wrong. Payloads were lost. So what went wrong? This is where I'm not really going to speculate. I bet you SpaceX knows exactly what they did wrong, and it's up to them to actually tell us what the problem is and how they're going to prevent it from happening again. Well, when I say us, it's not really us. It's actually the FAA. Uh, hold up. Why does the Federal Aviation Administration have anything to do with what happens in space. They shouldn't have a say in it, right? I mean, after it launches, it's not even near the United States anymore. So what does a United States entity have to do with telling a rocket launch provider that they can't launch their rocket anymore? Well, it comes down to being a good spacefaring citizen nation. 
Yeah, okay, whatever you say. Well, think of this. The Earth is a big place, and when we launch a payload into orbit, it doesn't just stay above the United States. In fact, the northbound Starlink trajectories out of the Cape end up shortly passing over Europe and eventually come right back around and go right over the United States again. Southern trajectories will end up going over Africa and loop back around going over the parts of Asia. So it's not just about the safety of American citizens on American soil. We want to make sure that launch providers that are operating out of the United States don't, I don't know, slam a payload into Paris or something like that. Aha! But these things are supposed to burn up. The Starlink satellites are small, and they're designed after their lifetime to re-enter the atmosphere and burn up without creating a problem. And the second stage also is supposed to burn up and not create a problem. So what's the problem here? Well, that's honestly a fair point. When the individual Starlinks re-enter, as long as they're disconnected from each other, they should re-enter much like regular Starlinks and not pose too much of a problem in terms of falling debris. Now, the second stage, however, is usually supposed to be deorbited in a very controlled manner. And the problem here is that it was deorbited in an uncontrolled manner. They actually lost control of it. The engine exploded, if you want to use that terminology. It was a rud. And that kept them from saying, all right, second stage, you're going to light your engine here, and that means you're going to deorbit here and burn up or splash down pieces in the Pacific Ocean or whatever. And not everything burns up. I mean, recall the recent story about the battery that was released from the International Space Station that crashed through a house in Florida. And there's been more than one event where the trunk of a SpaceX Dragon actually ended up in a farmer's field. In those specific situations, it wasn't even direct control of the reentry that saved us. It was just blind luck and statistics. The Earth is a pretty big place, and so if something randomly re-enters, maybe it's not going to hit anybody, which is okay. But maybe it will, and so we try to take as many steps as reasonably possible to ensure that it won't. So, how do you make sure that this is unlikely to happen again? Well, you need to understand what happened and what steps you can make to prevent it from happening again, or determine that, well, it happened, but because we were already doing other things to maintain safety, it didn't pose a big threat. Let's talk about that. The FAA actually has nine different conditions to consider when determining whether or not they're going to basically stop launches or consider it a mishap and require an investigation before that vehicle flies again. Here they are. Was there a serious injury or fatality? In this case, there were no crew on board and we haven't gotten any reports of debris coming down and hitting anybody, so I don't think that this would apply. Malfunction of a safety critical system. This is my opinion, but I'm on the fence with this one. Is the engine, which allows you to cleanly deorbit the second stage, a safety critical system? I'd probably want to ask the FAA exactly how they classify that, but, but I could understand that if the engine is no longer usable and that prevents you from deorbiting the second stage in a controlled manner, maybe that engine is a safety critical system. I don't know on that one. Let's mark that one a maybe. The failure of a safety organization, safety operations, or safety procedures. Here I think we're good. It's not like there was a boat on the range and you launched anyways and then there was a problem, so I'm not sure that that one's going to apply. The high risk of causing a serious or fatal injury to any spaceflight participant, crew, government astronaut, or member of the public. Well, this was an uncrewed mission, so there were no spaceflight participants, crew, or government astronauts on board, but it also says member of the public. And this is where we don't want a piece of a rocket that's lost control to crash into Disney World, or a piece of debris coming back down from space to end up in your bedroom. Is that what's being triggered here? That's a good question. Let's keep going. Substantial damage to property not associated with the activity. I mean, this is actual damage, not just the possibility of damage. And here, I don't think we've heard any reports of property being damaged that was not associated with the activity. Aha, so the next bullet point is unplanned substantial damage to property associated with the activity. Aha, so, so pay attention to that. You can launch a rocket off of the launch pad. And when you're launching that rocket, you can actually expect that the pad will take some amount of damage. As long as you plan for the pad to take that some amount of damage, that's not actually going to trigger that. Now, if the rocket explodes, I don't know, right on the pad and completely destroys the pad in an unplanned manner, like a way you didn't really anticipate, that'll trigger it. But if a couple lines get burnt off or something like that during the normal course of launching, maybe you'll want to fix that so that you can keep up your high rocket launch cadence, but that's not going to get the FAA on your heels. Now here, since this is talking about uh, damage to property associated with the activity, I'm not sure that this is the vehicle itself. Let's go to the next one. Unplanned permanent loss of the vehicle. Here you go. 
In this case, it's pretty clear that the second stages usually should stay intact until you tell them to, in a controlled manner, deorbit themselves. That didn't happen because the engine experienced a rud and they lost control of the stage, or at least the ability to cleanly deorbit it. So I do think here that this could trigger as unplanned permanent loss of the vehicle, which would cause the FAA to say, whoa, you didn't plan for that to happen. You didn't dispose of that vehicle in a controlled manner. We're going to have to look into this. <laughs> or actually, you're going to have to look into this. Impact of hazardous debris outside of defined areas. Now, here again, this is talking about the impact of debris. This isn't the potential for impact of debris. So even though it wasn't deorbited in a controlled manner, I wouldn't think that this one would be uh, what triggers an anomaly investigation. Again, we haven't had any reports of any damage actually occurring here, but it might just be statistics. We might have gotten lucky this time, but we need to make sure we take reasonable steps to ensure we're not crashing rockets into Disney World. I don't know why I always say that. Like, why is it always Disney World? I just envision a rocket going backwards from the cape and then uh, whatever. And the last one here is definitely a kicker. Failure to complete a launch or re-entry as planned. And we've got both of those things occurring here. Not only did the satellites not reach their planned orbit, so the failure of the launch occurred, but they also definitely didn't re-enter as planned. They re-entered in an unexpected manner. So I would say it's a really high likelihood that number nine on the list applies to the mission here. So how is the FAA going to do this big investigation and figure out what went wrong with the SpaceX rocket? What do they know about SpaceX's rockets? Well, the FAA does have a lot of experience with <laughs> decades of rocket launch operations in the United States and all over the world. So there is significant experience there in how does rocket debris uh, behave when it re-enters or uh, it doesn't launch in a controlled manner. But technically, specifics to the SpaceX rocket? You're right, the FAA doesn't really know how the SpaceX rocket itself operates. But that's actually why it's not the FAA doing the investigation. It's SpaceX that does the investigation. All the FAA is asking for is, hey, give us a report on what happened. You know your rocket, you have the data, look through it and just explain what went on. And this isn't anything special for SpaceX. Everybody launching rockets, or at least getting licenses to launch rockets from the FAA, has to follow these rules. Oh, well, it's a government organization with outdated, antiquated rules, right? They're just slowing us down. <laughs> well, the current regulations that are in effect were drafted and approved between 2018 and 2020 specifically to streamline launch operations for licensing and regulation, as well as to address the fact that there are some commercially reusable rockets that are drastically increasing the launch cadence. Okay, fine. So it seems fair. Like something went wrong with the SpaceX rocket. SpaceX probably knows what it was. And we just need to let the public know that we're going to be able to continue launching rockets without endangering anybody. In fact, straight from the FAA, a return to flight operations of the vehicle type involved in the mishap is ultimately based on public safety. The FAA must determine that any system, process, or procedure related to the mishap does not affect public safety or any other aspect of the operator's license. This determination can be made in one of two ways. Now, if you're interested in seeing Falcon 9's fly, pay attention here. One way is the FAA's acceptance of the final mishap investigation report. The operator-led mishap investigation final report must be completed, including the identification of any corrective actions. The FAA will review the report, and if accepted, the mishap investigation is closed. Then, if there's any corrective actions, they just say what the plan is for them, and they're able to resume launching. As long as they're meeting all of their other licensing requirements. But there's another way that doesn't require the entire mishap investigation to be completed before you return to flight. Check this out, the FAA public safety determination. The operator, that's SpaceX, may request the FAA make a public safety determination based on information that the mishap did not involve safety critical systems or otherwise jeopardize public safety. So in this case, before SpaceX even completes their full investigation, they can sort of mark off two things. Was it a safety critical system? And was the public ever in danger when this occurred? And if the FAA agrees, they can authorize a return to flight operations while the mishap investigation remains open. And SpaceX has actually done this before. If you remember Starship's third flight, SpaceX actually went through the exact same process and worked with the FAA to determine that the public safety wasn't in danger and they were uh, moving on with the license modification for Flight 4 before that mishap investigation was completely closed. So it's not just text and a page, it can actually work that way. Wouldn't be surprised if this one goes that way as well.
So if you think all that sounds reasonable, you might still be concerned. Well, SpaceX was going for almost 150 launches this year. The FAA is going to keep them from doing that. Well, again, it's SpaceX that launched the rocket here, and it's up to SpaceX to determine if they can launch their rocket without endangering anybody. But what's the normal return to flight? If you go all the way back to Sierra 7, it was six months after the Sierra 7 anomaly before SpaceX returned to flight. If you look at AMIX-6 that exploded on the pad, that was only four months. But the trick is, both of those investigations were very complex and involved upgrades and reliability overhauls of basically the whole rocket. It was also hundreds of flights ago. Falcon 9 and the second stage has a lot more experience now than they did when either of those things happened. If you look at other providers, Rocket Lab's Electron took eight months before returning after its first anomaly. But their second anomaly was less than two months to get back in business. Even after that, they had a couple where it was two months or three months. But in any event, the headline is that SpaceX has a ton of experience flying Falcon 9. They know their rocket. They know their systems. And I bet you it doesn't stay down for long. Beyond the experience, SpaceX also has another superpower under their belt. Historically, that's not really normal for a rocket launch provider to fly so many of their own payloads, but because SpaceX uses Falcon 9 to deploy the Starlink constellation, they have ample opportunity to basically risk their own skin and put another set of Starlinks on a Falcon 9 to prove to other customers that they can continue to fly these rockets safely. I personally think it's important that we continue to push our way into space, and I appreciate that one of the ways SpaceX does that is by moving fast and breaking things. I just think that it's reasonable that along the way, we need to make sure that some of the things we break aren't people's houses or faces or anything like that. Anyways, I hope you learned a little bit about how the process works there, because I know we're all raring to see rockets launch again. I'm John Galloway for NSF, and we'll see you nerds later.